Hello my lovelies. Welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel for the first time. It is a gorgeous uh, spring day here in Oregon. Just, I mean, I'm I'm bare shouldered, which is, it's a little chilly. It's getting a little chilly. The sun is going down. I got behind me my um, my faithful uh, 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 hot tub. This, this has been with me the whole time I've been in Oregon. So like 30 freaking years. <laughs> is that right? Not quite, not quite 30 years. A long time, a long time. And um, yeah, I've moved it from one house to another house. And uh, I uh, I have a, a wooden desk that I put across it and I write <laughs> in the hot tub. I read in the hot tub. I do not read tarot in the hot tub. I do not read, it's like draw the line there. Anyway, you don't care about my hot tub. You're here because I got a bunch of decks. I got five decks. Um, I've been really uh, grateful to have connected with folks at US Games. So they've sent me decks that I, I requested these particular decks because I thought I would like them, but these are for review and I wanted to share them with, with you. Um, and um, I don't think I'm gonna talk about all five today because that's a hell of a lot of decks. <laughs> But I think I will talk about three of them and I've already uh, opened them and flipped through them because I realized as I first, sorry for the airplane noise, as I realized as I first started uh, videoing that like, you know, it's just too crazy to try to process, to go through the deck, to try to process what's going on and have anything to say other than the hum da hum da hum da nice cardstock. Um, so let's just dive in, shall we? The first deck is, um, you know, this is not an art style that I think of myself as loving, but my recent acquisition quite off the, um, you know, without without thought of uh, Olivia Rose's tarot, um, mind's eye tarot, my love of the kind of intricate pen, uh, pen work and the kind of youthful, energetic imagery, the illustrative style. When I saw this deck, which is the Universal Folk Tarot by Anita Inverarty. Some of you may know her Universal Folk Oracle. I don't have that deck. I'm not an Oracle deck kind of person. Thank God for, you know, like my, my world would be even crazier than it already is if I were also collecting Oracle decks. Um, but um, I thought, you know, I might, this also tickles me. This also seems lovely. And, you know, if you look at uh, Anita Inver Inverarty's um, uh, website. She's a Scottish artist based in Aberdeen. She does uh, pen and ink. Um, the, that's the basis of her art. And she describes her art as kind of um, folk, uh, folk kind of loric influenced, but also Art Nouveau. I'm not sure if I, the Art Nouveau thing, I think, you know, the level of detail and the way in which there's the elaboration of like patterns I can see that this is very it's very fanciful and whimsical it feels very young and energetic to me but the palette is quite subdued so this you know these um, olive greens and the kind of deep um, burgundy and this sort of a very soft blue, this kind of dusty yellow. It's a very uh, subdued and quite graceful palette. It's not a hugely playful palette. I like it. Um, the reference to folklore, you know, it's called the universal folk tarot, the reference to kind of archetypes and imagery from folk. Um, these, these are kind of out of order, aren't they? How did the lovers get here? Um, here we go. Let's get let's get let's get this sh back in order. Get the kids back in the bus. Um, it's not every card, but each card has uh, some kind of animal representation and an association with uh, a crystal, which the crystals are maybe embedded in the imagery. There's a lot to look at here, and the guidebook is really chunky and full of detail, giving um, a discussion of the imagery, um, if there's a story behind it, um, talking a little bit about that archetype and talking about the animal representations and then also the symbols in the, in the artwork. By the way, this is what the backs look like. I'm losing my light a little bit, which is making the colors look a little bit darker than they might be. 
It's really quite, quite striking and beautiful. And a lot of thought, she's been a tarot reader for decades. There's a lot of thought that's gone into the use of the symbols. And as you'll see when we get into the minor arcana, like this hanged man, she has keywords for each of the cards. So let's just look at the devil for a second to give you a sense of the flavor of the guidebook. So the guidebook is really chunky, um, has you know a few pages for each of the cards, not just the major arcana. And uh, this devil is associated with Queen Mab. So a lot of her uh, folk references seem to be British Isles, kind of Celtic. So uh, keywords, we have addiction, codependency, restriction, bondage, dark side, shadow self. The crystal that's associated with this card for her is uh, lepidolite, lep lepidolite. I don't, I'm not, I'm not so knowledgeable about crystals. And I'm not sure if we see it in the card. Notice the two figures embedded in the card, the, 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 the usual imps. So she's, you know, definitely drawing on the Waitsmith imagery, but very liberally working with it. And these poison mushrooms. So the crystal that she's bringing forward to work with this card is Lepidolite. Lepidolite? <laughs> Someone tell me how to pronounce that word. Help with addiction and letting go of destructive behaviors. And then she has, you know, four paragraphs describing the card. I'm just going to read the first two. In the realm of the fairies, frequented by witches, the work of the devil was always felt to be near. Shown here, Mab is queen of this realm, but she, and she is in quotes, she's mindful, uh, Anita's mindful of, of the kind of importance of um, fluidity with the gender in the tarot, but she is also dual in nature and androgynous, representing the balance between male and female, which is, you know, some, I mean, this is the thing about tarot. Tarot is really, it, it brings forward binaries all the time, but, you know, back to the most sort of um, Marseille, early, you know, early modern imagery in the tarot, the, so many of the cards deconstruct that binary, and the devil is one of the, the cards that, you know, in the Marseille tarot, maybe I'll, I'll drop an image in here to show what I'm talking about, always deconstructs the binary, uh, binary gender. So Mab is queen of this realm, but is also dual in nature and androgynous, representing the balance between male and female and good and evil. In Scotland, the fairies are often divided into Seely, generally well-meaning and less provoked, and Unseely, those who live in the shadows and plot all manner of wrongdoing when humans wander into their path. Here, two hapless travelers have fallen afoul of an enchantment. They have stepped into a fairy circle where magic is brought forth. They are restrained in a trance, suspended in time, and prisoners of their own shadow sides playing out a loop of destructive, destructive behaviors and thoughts in their dreams. They are unconscious and susceptible to influence and persuasion. So you start to get the sense, I'm, I'm not reading the whole passage here, but you start to get the sense of how she is really bringing forward in a very layered way, um, stuff that she knows from kind of folk culture, stuff that she knows about the card from the history of tarot, and then her own kind of um, imaginal inventions, right? And then there's a second, an, a second part of the guidebook that talks about symbolic healing and guidance, and you have that for each of the cards. And she says, she brings forward different parts of the image. So she talks about the fairy ring. Um, what is the fairy ring here? I'm not sure. So it says the fairy ring spells and bindings that help someone, that keeps someone trapped in bondage. I think that's the, the green, that must be the green, um, cord around the two travelers and then the fairy mound so the the hills on either side of the queen mab character dwellings of uh, the tuatha de danan i am pronouncing that incorrectly folks i'm sorry an ancient fairy race in ireland secrets hidden aspects apologies for my poor pronunciation and then fire because we also see do we see fire in this Consumption, pain, purification, stone circles, magic, structure, regaining control. And then we have the message, right? So that's just the description of the card. And then we have an upright message and a reverse message. So 
two big chunks that give us the message. The devil card represents your hidden nature and your shadow self. It speaks, it speaks to our very base earthly desires and how they show up in our lives. Think of the seven deadly sins of pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Each may manifest in a set of behaviors that are self-destructive. It can often feel like there's a loss of control when these behaviors are led by shadow. We feel helpless and addicted to them. The upright card gives an opportunity to break free from the cycle. It can also point to a period of pleasure and debauchery that is short-lived and relatively safe to explore if shadow is not hiding there. I like I like how her layered reading of this card through Queen Mab and through Scottish kind of fairy lore allows her to see a really broad range of meaning in this card. So that is kind of gives you a, a sense of flavor for what she's doing with all of the cards here. And I have to say, you know, this is that beautiful cardstock that um, U.S. Games is using now, this kind of, this linen with these painted edges. It's really just, you know, they still have the copyrights. <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta have copyright. It's really just a beautifully produced deck. Now, how it will read for me... I don't like to use guidebooks so much, um, just, you know, because I want to I wanna dive in, unless I'm getting to know a deck really deeply. Oh, okay, once we get into, so here's something to notice. So once we get into the minors, we've got keywords. So uh, Ace of Cups, Compassion. Two of Cups, uh, Eternity. Right, so presumably in the minors, those keywords are going to probably be cued to um, oh, okay, so yeah, so this is she's calling forward um, they are playing out a ritual dedicated to Isis and Osiris, one of the greatest unions in Egyptian mythology, something that speaks to the eternal universe the couple face each other in divine union, they raise their cups in commitment to one another and drink, drink from a deeper level of understanding and communication. So, you know, she is giving us the meaning to this card through the imagery of Isis and Osiris, right? Through this Egyptian imagery. So it's, you know, she's making some references to other world cultures, Three of Cups, Coven. I like the Four of Cups, Unfurl. Interesting. Interesting keyword. I like her keywords. Why is that unfurl? A woman sits under the, the bough of a tree, deep in her thoughts and meditation. The tree supports her back and the branches provide shade. Four cups sits just to her side, offering new opportunities for her to consider. At this time, however, she shows no interest and chooses to ignore them. In her right hand is a fern pressed inside glass, suspended there to indicate she will unfurl in her own time. Interesting. So that sense of her unfurling that we might not uh, be drawn forth when the universe is expecting us to. We're going to take our time. In the night sky, a star shines brightly to show that the opportunities will wait and will still be there when she is ready. What a kind of compassionate reading of a card that is often seen just in its shadowy element. We're holding, holding our heart inside us and it might unfurl more slowly than others think is the correct rhythm or pace. Ooh, that's really interesting. So, you know, there's some, there's real depth of meaning in this deck. Now, I'm not sure that the artwork for me, in the end, invites that depth of reading, although I like it. Eight of Cups, the Trailblazer. It's I'm trying to read trying to read the keywords in the camera reversed. Oh, that's an interesting. Seven of Cups, 
conjurer. There's a, um, I like Six of Cups, Joy. I like what she's doing here. I feel like she is, yeah, the wish maker, Nine of Cups. That's beautiful. I like uh, how she is kind of expanding some of the range of meaning here. The light, the light bearers, yeah. It's an interesting deck. The tea leaf reader, knight of cups, the kelpie keeper. So the kelpie, that shape-shifting uh, seahorse, right? Beautiful. Queen of cups, the coral queen, king of cups, king of the sea. I could see that this deck, first of all, I think you can read it intuitively. The investor. I think you can read it intuitively. Um, you can use the keywords, right? Comfort and joy for the two of pentacles. Huh. You can dive into the depth of the guidebook, which is very rich. Three of pentacles. I'm not sure that reading it from the artwork alone, reading Oh, that's beautiful. Five of Pentacles, Aurora. So there's an example where, you know, to understand how that's the Five of Pentacles, I, I definitely need to go to the guidebook. So some of these cards are going to point you back there. Yeah, like six for gold for the Six of Pentacles. It's going to point you back to the stories, but it's not pointing you back. Like, it's not like the... Um, Tarot of the Divine. Wait, what's that? Oh, I can't remember the name. I'll, I'll plop it in here. But you know where you're really, you really have to know what the fairy tales are that are referenced to get that depth of meaning. There is, with the keywords, the family, yeah. With the keywords, you probably have enough to work with. Except when you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Page of Pentacles, Hugin and Munin, um, if you don't know what the reference is. Yeah. Some of the imagery is more flat and less layered, like this Knight of Pentacles contemplation. It feels quite flat. And then some of it feels more densely illustrated. It's... Um, one of the decks that I have that I'm going to talk about is the new re release of the Aquarian Tarot. And there's a way in which it, this is not, it doesn't feel like the Aquarian Tarot in terms of the, the palette or the type of artwork, but it has a kind of um, the sort of uh, sense that the Aquarian Tarot always gives me of things being very s static, like there's not a lot of movement. It's just, it, there's, it's also the Aquarian Tarot is also really Art Nouveau-ish. Um, sort of Art Deco, Art Nouveau, very, very um, detailed and elaborated. I love that Four of Swords. Pause. Yeah. So it kind of feels like an updated version of the Aquarian Tarot in a weird way, if that makes any sense at all. Oh, that's cute. But it's, it's also just its own, its own beast. What an interesting deck. Not not dumb. <laughs> this is a smart deck, but a little bit Eight of Swords, the Martyr. Um, how will it read? Yeah. And, you know, the color palette is just, it's a little relentless, so you're either gonna love it or you're gonna not be drawn to it at all. I quite like it. Uh, like all of my colors, you know, the sort of the teal and the brown and the black and that sage green. Oh, 
Beautiful. Anita Inverarity. Universal Folk Tarot. So. Mm. Okay. I love, love, love this new cardstock, this linen cardstock that US Games has been using and their decision to paint the sides of the deck in this kind of dark, dark, dark green, almost black. Um, it's lovely. I mean, they're, US Games is paying attention to us, you know? They're, they're seeing how how freaking crazy we are and that we edge our decks and, <laughs> and we love our linen. Okay, so, okay. Universal Folk Tarot. What, what do you have to, to bring to me? The Six of Cups, joy. Okay. All right. Let me just read a, a little bit about joy. Just, I don't want to, you know, I'm not a guidebook reader, but um, there is a precision to this deck. So Six of Cups, two sisters exchange gifts in front of their childhood home. Six vessels containing gloom. So it, it's really, uh, what are the birds? Magpies, two for joy from the folk poem, right? quality six uh, six is abundance balance stability emotions these are qualities associated with it well-being health nurturing life-giving smoke and hearth that's smoke in the background so ancestry that cat there's lots to read here so okay there's something nostalgic you're, you're gonna fill my cup you're bringing me this sort of joy um, are you explicitly wanting to connect me to childhood in some way to to nostalgia to the past is there some sense there i mean i'm finding myself drawn to these quite youthful feeling artworks in this deck and then olivia rose's mind's eye are you trying to take me to childhood to play ace of cups compassion yeah you're wanting to fill my cup i think Yeah. And a sort of opening of the heart. Very cupsy. Yeah, I can see the cups. What are what are all the birds? I'm getting a lot of birds here. What are you trying to say with all of this winged stuff? Ooh, okay. The high priestess. So um that bird, she's got the crow and a cat and the two pillars. Let me just, um, messengers from other realms. So uh, you're, you're wanting to open me up. They're like creating some imaginative, more imaginative space. Um, okay, how, how are you going to help me open to the, these messengers from other realms? Um, is it a problem that I'm not 100% drawn to your artwork? Okay. <laughs> All right. So maybe I'm creating my own, my own block here. What, is, what does she say about the Eight of Swords? Um, restriction, bondage, self-sacrifice. A woman is bound and blindfolded in the center of Eight Swords. She seems captive and sacrificial on first appearance. On closer inspection, it becomes evident that her bindings are quite minimal, right? This is the classic, you know, reading of this card. And if she removed the blindfold, she would see the scissors hanging around her neck. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, I'm not going to dive too deeply here, but like you're, you're saying, okay, you know, just open your eyes. Just open your eyes, dear. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Um, so what, anything I'm missing here, I'm getting a strong sense of you're going to help me kind of open up to a sort of intuitive realm. There's a sense of playfulness and um, filling my cup, uh, very watery. What else do I need to know here? Oops, I'm not going to work with reversals here. Um, there's something here in the, the mastery of that 
watery realm, king of the sea. Okay. Um, there's, this is part of the journey that I, I, right now I'm just, you know, as I've mentioned before, I'm, I'm in a counseling program and I'm working on kind of building up that part of my skill set and of my experience. You know, I do a lot of consultation, um, both as a chaplain and with tarot and with mindfulness coaching. And so I think there's something here about my working with imagination and archetype in the course of mastering this skill set. And this is going to be, are you saying you're going to be a tool? Um, maybe even something I literally work with clients with, or is this for me? Or what are you? Okay, you're this, I think you're, okay, so this is in my role, Queen of Charms. So this is in my work in that kind of nurturing, healing space, I think. Queen of Charms, let me just, it's a beautiful card. I find myself very drawn to that card. Queen of Pentacles. The, this queen invites you into her realm and holds, holds out a gift of a pentacle charm. This ruler is kind and generous. She protects her subjects and is likely to be a maternal figure. So you're talking about my work with others. Okay. Oof. I'm liking this deck, people. I'm liking this deck. Sorry. Sorry about the noise. Okay. Yeah, Universal Folk Tarot. Um, a rather deep deck with a sweetness to it and a really kind of open, playful, archetypal uh, richness to it. It's, it's, it's a deck that has a lot of thought in it. It feels quite... Um, it feels quite knowledgeable and is willing to look at a broad range of the meanings available for each of the cards. Now, <clears throat> a very, very different kind of deck, Steve Ehrenberg's uh, Ehrenberg Tarot. Um, a word, by the way, about boxes for those of you who care. So the Universal Folk Tarot is one of these big two-part boxes that has quite a meaty guidebook in it. If you're the kind of person who puts the whole thing on your bookshelf, this is lovely. If you're the sort of person who wants to, like I am, who wants to take your deck out, it's kind of a, oh, perhaps a waste of cardboard, but, um, but you know, U.S. games, they're not able to please all of us. Um, Ehrenberg Tarot also comes in a two-part box with a small guidebook which is basically just a glorified little white book. Although the guidebooks were written by Karen Boginski, one of the um, one of the sisters behind the um, influence of Angels Tarot. Anyway, super different kind of deck than what we've just looked at. Um, Ehrenberg comes to the tarot from work in design and advertising, and um, I was just reading about him a little bit. Um, in, he, he's a well-known dealer and collector of early technology um, and is a consultant to the movie and TV industry. So really interesting guy. I'm not sure what his connection to tarot is, but this is a beautiful okay, deck. Okay, so I've come inside, turned the camera around, and just going to do a more sort of traditional flip through of this deck beginning with talking about the cardstock. You know, this is your typical US Games cardstock. It's excellent, it's very reliable. It's like a make playing cards standard smooth. Just basic, nice light sheen to it, really good snap. Um, you know, I've got the white borders all around, which I think work really well with the, this inset double border throughout um, that is consistent throughout the deck. Yeah. the. Uh, sort of brick red and the sage green very very nicely produced now you know i've gotten kind of spoiled when you have decks like anita in uh universal folk tarot or olivia rose's uh mind's eye tarot that new linen cardstock that u.s games is using on some of their decks particularly i think on their decks that have a more like oracle card feel to them with the painted edges uh, you know this feels like a really Lux product. This feels like, you know, just good. It's good. Nothing, nothing to complain about. Um, of course, 
sort of we're dealing with a kind of regular tarot card size here as well. The thing about the Ehrenberg Tarot, you know, Steve Ehrenberg's background in advertising and kind of that design aesthetic, graphic arts aesthetic, you know, he says, in Smith's tarot art, Pamela Coleman Smith's art, you are a viewer looking inward toward the scenes. He wants to turn that around and have the subjects in the cards looking back, inviting the reader to take this journey along with them. This deck focuses attention on some of the key aspects of this car- of the card. A reader open to this approach, this approach may find a laser-like focus to this deck, one that may illuminate elements of a card that might otherwise be murky or overshadowed. The striking look is both bold and simple, like vintage poster art. I only wish Stuart Kaplan was here to see them. Yeah, that would be that would be nice. It does have that poster art feel to them, and the thing about this. Uh, laser-like focus, his his zooming in. I think this is less that he's having us look from the inside out as it is using the focus on a specific element of these familiar cards, using it to highlight a symbolic element or, or a point of interest. It's like a keyword, and it's strong as a strategy in the same way that keywords are strong. You know, they can help us focus, and it's you know, weak in the way that keywords are also weak. If we don't like the keyword, if we don't agree with that choice, then we're kind of stuck with the ways that the artist has captured our attention. So, you know, to contrast with something like the Universal Folk Tarot, where she has a bunch of elements and symbols to give and keywords, she gives us multiple pathways in. The Ehrenberg Tarot is really narrowing our pathways in to really to one strong approach. So it's a strong deck in that way, strong choices, which we may not always agree with. Okay, so I'm going to just zoom in a little bit and go through the deck one card at a time. And I'm not going to say a whole lot unless I see something that seems to me important. So one thing I notice in the beginning cards is this focus on the eyes looking back at us and the uh, headdress. And then we move to the empress and the emperor, and now we have the hands, and the hands containing sort of symbols of power. So the symbols of kind of rule with the emperor, and then the symbols of fertility with the empress holding the pomegranate. And now this merging of eye and hand with the hierophant. So that that's interesting. You know, this, this elemental focus on parts of the body that signify. And then what you do with a card like the chariot that has that um, dialectical feel to it where we have, you know, the two the two sphinxes and the charioteer himself. So that sense of, you know, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, for those of you who have heard me talk about this, but that law of three, that that way that that triads work in the tarot to give us a kind of relationship between two opposing parts and then their reconciling reconciling focus, which we don't get in the lovers, even though the, the Waite Smith card does that with the male and female and the angel above them. We also don't get that with the hierophant, which you could. So we lose that dialectical feel in this deck where there's a kind of singular focus that's happening here. So, you know, this isn't so much about the relationship between the lady and the lion, but the lady is, has the lion emblazoned on her chest. Mm, I'm not so fond of that hat. Let me just see if he says something interesting about the wheel. Round and round it goes where it stops. Nobody knows. The wheel reminds us that fate can be fickle, but it always changes. Sometimes we hit a rough patch, but if we wait long enough, our luck will change. Accept it all with grace. Now, the guidebook wasn't written by him. It was written again by Karen Boginski. But yeah, it doesn't help me, you know, the carnival feel, the the game feel. I think it, it, to me, this trivializes the wheel of fortune a bit. Oh, I like that. Um, am I losing my framing here? <laughs> Apologies, people. Okay, I like that focus on the feet. 
you know, and sometimes the focus can give us really, like I love bringing attention to the flowing water between the two cups. But, you know, with the devil again, um, this movement to the eyes makes us think about, oops, makes us think back to the fool, the magician, and the high priestess. But, um, but it doesn't give us that kind of dialectical sense of the three elements in the traditional card. And then this pulling back with the tower, that's interesting. The people are really depersonalized, they're just shadows, and there are three of them now instead of two. It's a very, I mean, I think this is, it, it has the feel of vintage art, that poster art feel that he talks about in the guidebook. I love that. Oh, that's delightful. The focus on the dancer's feet. That's like, yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Now we do have that dialectical feel. We have the, the lion that's in the, the caduceus in the traditional Waitsmith imagery over sort of overseeing, over look, looking over the two cups. Now, oh, this is interesting. So we have in the three of cups, we just see one hand. In the four of cups, we see three hands which calls forth the imagery of the Waitsmith. There's no way you could read this deck without knowing the Waitsmith. Like that intertextuality is really cool, the way that this deck calls out the Waitsmith deck. Hmm. That's lovely. The Page of Cups, this sort of fish uh, the vessel of the fish, the fish itself as a cup. I'm not sure, this is an interesting deck. I'm not sure that I want to read with it. But as I move through it, oh, well, that's interesting. That three of pentacles. Hmm. This is quite evocative, this five. Walking toward the church. Yeah, is that right? It's a figure facing toward, yeah. The church, but the church is in the distance. It's cinematic, you know? Oh, I love this attention to the falcon. The falcon with its hood. The blinded falcon, looking back at us, but unable to see us. <laughs> the old man and the dog snout. So yeah, there's this real, I mean, there is a kind of delightful, oh, I love that queen with her, with the bunny. Oh, and this kind of obscuring You know, so is this is this King of Pentacles suggesting a kind of obscuring of vision through wealth? Oh, and the transparent hilt of the Ace of Swords. You know, in the Pamela Coleman Smith image for this card, we don't see the faces. Then the way that we're seeing only partial parts of the faces, you know, the eyes, but not the mouth, or one eye, but not the other eye. Mm. The way that that 
seeing only the partial part of the, the face is in the Seven of Swords related to the role of masks, the role of personas, the way that we hide parts of ourselves. Oh, wow. Now this is interesting because this is not picking out an element of the card as much as it is redefining the card with that umbrella. Hmm. Yeah, there's something here about the obscuring of vision. And what distinguishes the page from the queen? Or from the king, for that matter? Yeah, I like... I like this transparency in the aces, this sense that the hands are holding something but are not quite substantial themselves. <laughs> the confetti. Yeah, it's very emblematic. Like you can see this as an opening shot in a in a film, right? This zooming into the combatants. So it's it's less, you know, he says in the guidebook, he wants us to be in the inside of the scene looking out rather than looking into the scene. But it's it really is more like, you know, the, the, the moment that establishes a shot and then we move into the action. Hmm. I'm sure I understand this image for the Seven of Wands. Why, why is it two different? I guess his boots are coming down. Is that right in the in the Coleman Smith image? Yeah, I have to have to look at that. This eight. you know, a card that's about the sort of rapidity, the movement of the wands, which here, yeah, doesn't really feel, I mean, there's a blocking of movement. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> The, the horse sort of rearing up. I'm not going to go anywhere. Okay. So, all right. So let's shuffle and let's try to read with this. Let's see. Let's see where we get. And, you know, this card shot. It's great. I mean, it shuffles great. It's not the linen, but it really does shuffle great. So I'm going to shuffle it for a bit and then turn the camera back around and, and talk to you. So the question now is, is this deck more of a kind of gimmicky deck, like um, after tarot or before tarot, one of those decks that, that helps you think about the meaning of cards or... Um, you know, helps you think about what a suit is doing or what different issues in tarot are doing. Those decks are fun to have and they can be really, really useful as we're studying tarot. They can be really useful as we're trying to plunge deeper into the meaning of a particular card. However, they aren't necessarily great for uh, soulful, depthful readings. So is this deck, is this more of a study gimmick deck or is this a reader deck, a reading deck? And I'm not sure yet. So let's give it a shot. Okay, Aaron Berg Tarot. What do you have to show me? All right, King of Pentacles. So are you, yeah, I mean, this is a card that I actually had trouble with when we were going through the deck, right? Because it, it to me, you know, we've got vision being obscured by the resources in, in between. So I think this is my question. Are you, are you going to help me see, or do you, are you kind of blinded by your own, your own resources, your own cleverness? Um, what are you going to help me 
C, are you going to help me see? That's my question. And you're kind of playing that question back to me. Oh, I'm all upside down here. So, the three of wands. Okay, you're inviting me. You're inviting me somewhere, but it feels like my way is blocked, okay? I think of the three of wands as about exploration and moving forward, um, going through, committing oneself to a path. But this feels, I mean, it feels very sure-handed, but something feels blocked. I'm, I'm seeing the kind of crisscross at the neck here. Um, I'm feeling choked by this. Are you going to... Are you going to help me through this portal? How are you going to help me through this portal? What what is your what is your gift to me? Okay. So, do you want are you saying you want me to kind of join forces with you a little bit more? Okay. Say more. I'm I'm willing to join forces. How do I do that? How do I join forces with you? How do we pull our energies together? Okay. Are you, I have to give up things that I think I know? Are you just going to drop things? Are you just going to drop and break things? Can I, can I trust you? I think that's the question I'm asking, Aaron Bertero, is can I, can I trust you? Because I feel like I'm having to give up a lot to know you. And I'm saying, can I trust you? And you're saying, yes, you can trust me. Open your hands. Open your hands. Okay, I'm going to open my hands. I'm going to open my hands and I'm going to open my eyes. I'm going to open my hands. I'm going to open my eyes. What happens then? The cup is full of everything. <laughs> yeah, okay, but... The cup is full of everything. You're saying, bring it all. And this is a seven, you know, seven of cups famously is all these different cups and you have to choose. But in this seven of cups, when you try to convey that, that notion of there being many, many options, what you get is one cup containing it all. So you're saying, it's all here. It's all here. You're giving it all to me. Okay. You're giving it all to me. What do I need to give back to you? I need to be willing to change. I need to not hold on so tightly. Okay. I'm still unconvinced, although this is a powerful card. And I feel like I want to ask one more thing of you. I want to ask if I can, if I can let go, if I can open my hands, if I can recognize that it's all here, all of the contexts that I need are carried here, and if I can allow that transformation to happen, I don't have to hold on so tightly with my death grip. If I can loosen up, what happens then? What happens then? Okay, <laughs> three of cups. Okay, all right, I will, I will, I will read with you. I will read with you. I will take up this challenge, which means letting go a little bit of control and trusting that it's all there. Um, this this seven of cups is really super interesting. Trusting that it's all carried here in this, these cards in their deep editing, they're carrying all of the archetype. It's all there. This is the thing actually about tarot is it's, I'm going to talk about this in my mindful tarot community tomorrow on the, uh, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 8 a.m. If you're not part of the community yet, all you need to do is join. It's not hard. And just drop me an email or go to the Facebook page and um, ask to join the Facebook. We have a Zoom the third Sunday of every month at 8 a.m. Pacific time. But this one, one of the things I'm going to talk about tomorrow in the Zoom is tarot is fractal. When I say that tarot is a mandala, when I say that it's... Uh, a, a unified holistic system that contains everything. I'm also saying that it's fractal, that every one little piece contains it all. And that's, I think, what the Ehrenberg Tarot is reminding me, that, you know, he can edit the cards down. He can choose, it's like a keyword. He can choose one angle. It can feel like it's not quite right. 
but it's all there. Just open our hands, open our eyes. Okay, enough for now. Um, I was going to talk about three decks, but this is already a freaking long video, and I'm going to stop right here. Thank you guys for your practice, and as always, thank you so much for watching. Take good care. Blessings to you.